This is More Than Work, the podcast reminding you that your self-worth is made up of more than your job title. Each week, I'll talk to a guest about how they discovered that for themselves. You'll hear about what they did, what they're doing, and who they are. I'm your host, Rabia. I work in IT, perform stand-up comedy, write, volunteer, and, of course, podcast. Thank you for listening. Here we go. Hey, well, welcome back to More Than Work, everyone. I have a guest on today that I have known for a long time. I actually knew his sister first. We worked together about 20 years ago, which is crazy to think. And then he and I met, and we've been friends as well and lived in New York at the same time. And I'm really glad to have Fernando Cabigting on. And he is a founder. And we're going to talk about what he's founded and what he does. How are you, Fernando? I'm good. Yeah, I'm happy we can finally make this happen. Yeah, me too. And where am I talking to you from today? I am in New York, to be specific, in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn. Nice. In my basement. And a, yeah, in your basement. I'm in a basement because I live in a basement. So <laughs> that's great. <laughs> that's great. We're both basement people now, <laughs> which we weren't when we met necessarily. So yeah, so I guess, I mean, I've been following you either when I was living in New York or on online for a long time and you founded a business but before that you were working in fashion and so let's talk about first about I guess what you were doing in fashion and then how you got to founding the business you have now which is I would say in a way related but not the same thing at all yeah no I totally agree well when we first met actually Mm -hmm. I was in advertising in San Francisco and I was just making my move to Southern California I think I met you at some sort of employee event at your previous company. Anyhow, I was doing advertising in San Francisco, actually was moving to LA to, to uh, transition into fashion. And I was working for a company called BCBG in LA. I went from advertising to starting a trim and hardware division for this fashion company, where it literally is designing zipper pullers and buttons. I went to the interview even thinking I was interviewing for a textile design position. Because I do nothing about buttons or zippers. Uh, but I ended up doing that. And the story, the reason I'm going back to it, is I actually went into it only because it made sense for me because I was already designing packaging labels and packaging for wineries mm-hmm. and different companies in LA. So I was able to render three dimensionally. And so that's how I got this job as a hardware trim designer because I could render three-dimensionally. Within a year, took over a jewelry division. I was hired for one brand and within three months, I was designing for five brands and went from managing one assistant to, I think, three to seven freelancers at any given point or time. Hmm. Um, And basically said no to nothing. And obviously, then got everything. And at one point for the first year I was in LA, I was working from like 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. every day. Mm. the first year because i was thinking i'll I'll go and i'll go i'll move to la get into fashion but i wanted to kill it i knew that if you made yourself indispensable you could basically ask for anything you want and the idea is that i would move from la to new york in a year but a year came around and i really just wanted to stick with this division that i created Mm -hmm. but also found that i didn't own a fork a spoon or uh, hadn't even cooked in the apartment I was living in LA and realized I should maybe try living in LA. And that's with that in mind that the stint in LA actually ended up lasting for three and a half to four years. And then that's when I moved to New York. And in New York, I sort of was able to sort of pull back. And instead of like designing, I don't know, five to 10 product categories, I basically stuck with handbags. And was designing handbags in New York, working for, at the time, a large licensee company. If it wasn't the largest, it, has to, it had to be the second largest fashion company in, in the U.S. Because mm-hmm. they did everything from like Walmart to Fifth Ave. And uh, yeah, I ended up staying in New York. Uh, I'm still getting now, obviously. That was 2010. Around 2017 is when, for me, fashion became something that it just didn't have the same sort of energy or didn't really inspire the innovation that I really loved about fashion. I've always been in sort of one way or another, it's sort of obviously in some sort of creative field. 
Mm-hmm. And earlier on, I really already knew that I wanted to be in the creative field. And the, the reason why I went into advertising versus not versus going directly into fashion or moral is because that was what was most visible to me. You know, like, yeah. you know, in my family, there was no one who was in the creative field. They were either in the military, they were in some sort of medical field. I mean, every Filipino family has like three aunts that are nurses. Uh-huh. My other family now, no different for sure. My only only thing I knew about creativity was like you can go into advertising, you can like design back when there were CD covers, you can design CD covers. I actually went to art school thinking I would design CD covers. And fashion uh, wise was sort of as I was getting into the creative industry, trends always come from fashion, whether it's a color palette or uh, any kind of like that kind of conversation. So I, I thought I'd go into that. But 2017 basically the, the entire ecosystem of fashion kind of kind of fell apart. Designers were sort of left to almost spend for themselves because you don't have a sales team that understands who or where those sales, what those sales channels were. Big box stores were declining. Online at the time was already obviously situated, but even that was a little bit hard to measure, especially for the, some of these brands I was designing for, where there was luxury. Everyone just knew how to design for like a, I don't know, holiday Labor Day sale. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I think that was when I sort of like started pivoting and I took a one year sabbatical. And at one point I thought I wanted to work and create my own menswear brand. And I was traveling to LA to sort of figure that part out and trying to align this idea of this world of fashion. What I knew is a familiar thing that I had been doing for so long to my now like a little more familiar with like mother nature, like, you know, recycled, understanding your carbon footprint, things like that. Because after being in fashion for so long and creating everything from Walmart to Fifth Ave and really seeing where those things kind of like came from, like the factories and working conditions of those in China and some of these factories I've worked with, what it takes to create that real smooth finish on a, on a hardware for a handbag. Yeah. The last thing I wanted to do was to not only design that and then not have any responsibility for it, but also to introduce it and have it be like another fast fashion that's just not sort of contributing to a, a larger school view, a larger thing mm-hmm. altogether. I just wasn't really interested in, interested in doing any of that. And so that one year sabbatical was literally me connecting with everyone and anyone who had sort of like a moment to even have a conversation with me. Because I was having like literally what that looks like is like copy dates. And after every copy date, I would ask, the person I was with, is there someone else I should have a coffee date with? Name three more people. And then on the spot, I would give the people a call. I would text them, I would email them, and I would never not have a coffee date lined up. And that kind of led me to multiple different paths. And I always loved parties. My partner now has been go, and I used to always host dinner parties. Like in LA, we would do like a Halloween party, chop down his parents' oak tree. We had this loft in the art district and time up on all of like the pipes and whatever railing and have people go through like a canopy of like leaves. And I love that. And we would go all out and we'd have a dinner party, design menus. And I was like, you know, I let me look into that. What does that look like? And in the end, it sort of just kind of like filtered through. And I was like, you know, I love the the organic, the three-dimensional again, these experiences that kind of like contributed or created some sort of happiness and joy in someone else's life, whether it's just for three hours or for like, you know, a moment. But when I started to look into that, I started working with some of the designers who were like putting like the Met Galas, the, the big New York library like events, I just really wanted to see, are they really DIYing these things? Are they going to Ikea painting everything? And then like, in my case, are you returning it back? You know, <laughs> and they weren't. Everything was very crafty. Everything was exactly what it was. But the difference was it was also very corporate. And I didn't want to go back into another corporate creative sort of like thing where it just didn't have the the soul, the thoughtfulness that I was looking for. Mm -hmm. And I ended up working with a smaller, on the opposite end of the spectrum, floral design studio. And I never thought of floral, like that it has like a voice that kind of stemmed from like art. I only thought it was a service, right? I didn't realize how you can even monetize this idea of being a floral or floral designer, or what that title was. I thought you were just a florist that had like a freaking mortar shop that made me case for someone who just ran in last minute, you know? 
Mm-hmm. Um, and then I was introduced to this whole new world by another small design firm here who had more of a directional sort of like point of view. They worked directly with clients, created the atmosphere. It was, it was very much the same energy as a fashion company where you really truly made something that was bespoke, that was catered for like a time and a moment or a special occasion, whether it's a wedding or in my case, I redo a lot of like brand collaborations with some of the companies I actually designed handbags for in New York that took more of a 360 approach to the way they worked. They sourced things locally. All the organic materials were composted. Things were recycled, most often reused. And all of that, there was like a level of honesty and everything that they did, whether it's the way in which they were transparent, communicating how their process and how they work from start to finish was to their clients, to the way in which they treated all the materials, the way in which obviously then resulted to the way in which they treated their employees and how people were paid. All these things were all within that sort of thing, you know, like I'm doing a whole rebranding of my studio now. And I realized that one thing I did that I bypassed, which I should have really just hammered down is really created in the end, if it is a physical thing, a design like branding guide that then outlines your Mm. brand values that then allows you to then anchor yourself and move through your path with those kind of like pillars in a way. Long answer to your question, but yeah, that's how it was. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and I think it is funny because just now that you're you're going to redo that and have a guidelines, because I think that those help you just stay focused and just when you're even if you're not sure about a decision to make, you can consult those and like, is this aligned with those guidelines and what our brand and or if a client comes to you, you're not sure about, OK, well, one thing I can ask myself is, is this aligned to what I said? And if it's not, did what I say change or does it truly just not align with me? And and it, it helps, you know. Totally. And like, obviously, it's not a discussion. It's like, a, like even a fraction of a second that all this happened. Yeah. I started this brand in 2017, but in reality, it was November 2017. At the time, we like to take our little breaks and vacations in November to be, uh, to be exact Thanksgiving because uh, when we would visit my husband's family in Japan, is that no American for traveling. So like, it's a perfect time. Like, your flights are cheaper. But so we actually yeah. went and uh, went to Japan immediately as soon as I like basically got this thing started and then didn't even really function as a working brand or try to cultivate our own like client list for not another three to four years. So in reality, mm-hmm. we've only really had this brand for almost four years. And it feels like every year it's a different startup. It's not the same thing. And maybe it's like it's New York and here yeah. we have every again major industry that just found legends. So we just get so much like every season is a different market. It's fashion week, it's it's tabletop week. Now we're in September, it's peak wedding season, but it also happens to also be market week for a lot of design companies. And it's also like the, the month in which there's a lot of like benefits and galas. And the reason why I'm bringing it up is that we never had a moment to actually sit down, not only to nail down those core values, but then to also in more importantly, revisit what those are every year. Yeah. And then now I still see the same sort of potentials and innovation within Flow that I saw when I first got started. Now I'm actually interested in like maybe adding on to that language on botanicals and maybe going back into like maybe a product offering that's more seasonless. Mm-hmm. And now we're going to apothecary. We created great relationships with all these amazing local farmers that are women, POC, queer, who I'd love to like champion and sort of like work more closely with, who also happen to have like these, not the easiest thing, organic, biodegradable, biodynamics or like practices around growing their floral. And I think that's a huge deal. Mm -hmm. So now we're creating some sort of partnership with them where maybe we're bringing in these locally grown stems to the city in the form of a subscription program and then we have an amazing community in brooklyn whether they're makers designers artists that have these studios some of these studios are pickup location partners where they're like design destinations that you can pick up these beautiful locally grown flowers but also allows for these businesses to also maybe have more foot traffic and maybe build uh, a, a better sort of like a relationship with the community around them. Because obviously people think they're probably going to be from the neighborhood. I think what a, the way in which I've been operating this whole entire time has been like constant test mode. 
But mm. now I, I want to step back and be able to sort of like pick and choose which areas I want to focus on. We're relaunching a website, focusing on maybe creating a journal and putting more words to all these things that are floating in my head and connecting with these people that see some interest in what we're doing. Because I think there's a missing out there that, to be honest, it looks like me, a first-year immigrant, queer, Asian, Pacific Islander male, these conversations that can add something or inspire something in someone else, or at the very least, give more context to what and how we're doing things. Because I think everything that I do, everything that most people do is a reflection of who they are. It's definitely more of a portrait of who we are. Um, I think that needs to be part of the story. And that's kind of the reason why we're sort of doing this whole rebranding thing. Because even the simple question, okay, how, what decision am I making? How am I communicating that to a client? And then obviously there's other things involved. Like what is that value money number wise, you know? Or in my regard right now, like I am trying to create an apothecary assortment of products that will be like candles, uh, soaps and things like that. Super simple enough, right? Not, not to say the most innovative thing. To be honest, it's a, it's a bit... Uh, like, you know, anyone can do it. Like, every, everyone's grandmother used to make soap, you know what I mean? But at the same time, I'd like to kind of, like, put our own sort of, like, language into it. And then, again, going back to those brand values or those core values, what does that look like when you package this thing? Am I using a ton of plastic? So to complete that, like, we're trying to push things forward by using plant-based inks, uh, rice paste for glue, no plastic, even delaying certain products such as like, you know, liquid soap because there's no, to me, there's not something that I would want to put out there that now still has like a plastic pump connected to it, you know? Yeah. So one thing you mentioned was just your status as a person of color. You mentioned you're Filipino, which we didn't uh, get into at the start. And then also that you have a husband go and you're queer and that you're going to vendors or growers for the flowers that are fitting into person of color category or possibly queer. And so for you, and then also the value of the environment. So for you, like having these things reflect you, I mean, one thing I can say is I know there aren't that many businesses still founded by people of color and then that they're successful too. That's definitely a stat that you can, anyone can look up, but for you, how did you come to decide that you wanted to reflect those values in your work? Because you could be a queer man or you could be an immigrant or a child of immigrants or you could be a person of color or any of these things without having that be part of what you're trying to impact as well. So how did you make that decision? I, I think it, was, it, was, it wasn't it was something that was, oh, hey, I need to do this. Like it wasn't, it wasn't like some sort of epiphany that sort of came upon me. I think we're all individuals and it wasn't something that, I sort of set out to do in a way. I never thought I would be an entrepreneur type. I just thought I would always be in this, in this sort of corporate sort of like world and that sort of thing. To me, it just became organic in a way where um, I just had the need to say and do what I thought was best. And I, in the end, didn't want to have someone else sort of monitoring that or have any sort of say. Right now, I'm sort of playing with the idea and trying to gather like mentors and folks who could maybe assist me with like moving things forward, but also looking into like the idea, maybe getting like an investor or like a business partner, things like that. There's things in which other people could contribute to this mm. brand or this thing that I'm creating that could really, really push things forward more than just making sure like the business is ongoing, that it is like, you know, performing well. I think there's something here that could be super important for someone else. You know what I mean? Like, I love the idea of maybe putting together even a children's book that like deals with like this idea of identity and how could that relate to what I'm doing. But for me, coming to where I am now and having that and how that connects with my now identity, in the end, it was something more of a... It needs to be out there. I don't see it. I can do it. And I'll do it my way in, in, the, in the way I know how with the sense of honesty. My husband and I take a lot of like self empowerment courses. One of the things I'm, I'm working with is like this idea of like love and where that all comes from. And everything just really just stemmed from that idea, whether it's how you choose the way you your life, 
uh, how, what will you choose for breakfast to whether you want to go out to go take a run to how you, how you treat yourself and those around you. It all comes down to that love. And that's where sort of everything myself and everything I do for, for the florals and for X, Y, and Z. And in the end, that's kind of where this idea like policy where this business also came about as well. I value what I do, my life and others around me. And this is the way to me I can contribute to not only myself, but to others as well in a way that has like that's in full integrity, things like that. I want to be a creative person, but I can't do it for another corporate company that, again, um, is just another sort of numbers game. Yes, I am putting out a product out there, but at least with this product, not only do I believe it, but I'm the one responsible for making sure that it, it is what I think it should be. And then I think part of that is to tell where it's coming from. And what obviously that's who I am, you know? I just actually had a conversation with my branding manager and there's always a fine line, like how much of this story is part of what you put out there. You know what I mean? Like I'm a for-profit company. I'm not trying to save the world and be this poster child for immigrants who come to America, for queer, whatever. My goal is still in the end to create something beautiful and this is the form it's taking. And yes, that part of me who that physically looks like this with my with my background and all these conversations can't be removed from that. And I'm not trying to remove any of that. So it is a fine line of like, now how do you communicate and bring that into the world so that your products still are, or your services are still the highlight and still the forefront of what is happening. That's great. Yeah, that's really cool. I mean, just just hearing, I mean, you said you're taking personal empowerment courses, but also just hearing about you founding your business. It wasn't a matter of you even changing industries necessarily at all, which some people do that, but really just changing your place in an in industry. And it happens to be floral versus other events versus design of textiles, whatever, and zippers and, you know, depending on how you look at it, but really you, you, you're still in the design industry, just totally. your position is different. Yeah. And like one of the things that I sometimes bring up when this conversation comes up is that to go back to what I said earlier, I didn't have like a role model growing up who was like, you know, Oh, Hey, this is, so and so, he's mm-hmm. like an amazing ceramicist or painter, artist, sculptor, or whatever, or things like that. Like my parents and family were always creative. I had an amazing, amazing parents, amazing mother, who like instantly was like, "You're amazing at this. Do what you want to do for it. Whatever education aspect thing you need, do it." Being immigrants, first generation immigrants here, like we had to start all over again. And I didn't grow up with everything and anything, but they made sure that we got the education that we needed. We were at least supported, but. Growing up and going to school, art school-wise, I ended up gravitating towards designers, artists who were super multidisciplined. They were designing fonts to packaging who didn't see a sort of like label to whether or not they were architects or whatever, who designed everything, furniture, you name it, you know? And I just kind of stuck, I just kind of kept with that. And the way I see it, whether you're, you're using I don't know, a wheel or you're creating something with a torch and metal or you're working with Photoshop and Illustrator or just doing an illustration or whatever. They're all just tools. And in my case, I I love a three-dimensional thing. I I learned that really quickly earlier on that I love products. I love learning about people's patterns and human migration and what that looks like, world history and how that relates to like the way in which people live their lives. All those things I think are super fascinating. That then gets like, you know, disseminate to like everything else that we do. You know what I mean? What that looks like in a sense of this idea of like beauty or this idea of health or why is it that men now all wear these tight pants that like 10 years ago, that would be like the most awful thing ever. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and how casual Fridays are like 24-7. All of those <laughs> things I think are super fascinating. And how technology is now affecting the way in which we all live our lives and how young kids are so exposed to it. Like, I love all those things. And I think it's like that curiosity. I think that's kind of what drew me initially to advertising and then fashion. The thing I love most about all of these things is actually the research. The cultivating of things, the trying to understand all the little pockets of it and why these things are. And then, to be honest, like making those work for a certain person or whoever, you know? And then I think the working in a creative corporate environment just kind of fed all of that. I had every tool I needed. As a small business person now, not having all those tools, like I have to relearn all those things. I don't have a marketing department, a sales department, lean on to like, hey, what were the sales last year? So-and-so, take photos of this, bring it back to me when it's Photoshop or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you don't have yeah. 
spreadsheets right in front of you. I have to like find all those myself, like create those tools and ways to measure performance or whatever. So it's really interesting. Yeah, that's a lot. It's a lot different. And then is there anything you said like nature, but is there anything that inspires your floral design specifically? Because you definitely use different materials. And I mean, so one thing is your sister and I worked at proflowers.com. So that was um a very much a corporate dozen roses slash here's a mix of flowers that always has been mixed together kind of thing. Yeah. But you use some, I would say, organic material that's not always traditional, just based on looking at your Instagram. So what inspires you with how you design? Yeah, um, I think what I love leaning towards right now is are things that are more structural or artful. And I love texture. It doesn't even have to be a uh, floral. Everything is a weed until it's made a flower, right? Or called a flower. Mm -hmm. Anything can be put on a table and called art or design. And more importantly, it's a service in the end of the day. Like we come in from the back door and we leave the back door. We don't, we're not coming in from the front door. We're offering a service. And to me, sometimes what that means, it has to serve a purpose, obviously. Um, I have a call later on tomorrow for a bridal company. They have a theme that's all about, luckily, about Ikebana. I love me some Wabi Sabi moments. Mm -hmm. um, so what does that look like? And then now we're moving into that. You know what I mean? And right now there's a huge trend on little vignettes that incorporate fruit, you know, where these fruit are actually seen more as shapes. It's like a beautiful mound of grapes that creates a beautiful little pyramid. And then maybe a couple of flowers come popping out, you know, but the flowers are more than a gesture. So when you start thinking about these flowers or whatever it is as materials, there's no rules to anything. We're doing something for the Whitney Museum where they wanted something that was large scale, but that just sort of captures a moment. And we're creating basically a canopy of fabric and then we're shooting up air. So that kind of moves like as if like you're in some sort of like windswept sort of like mm -hmm. you know, beach or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. And we're adding flowers to it. There's like lighting components to it, like all these different things to it. It's a little bit of everything. And in the end, the inspiration does come from nature because I'm not trying to, A, fool anyone to think that they're, that these things are, like, you know what I mean, growing in this museum lobby. Yeah. At the same time, there is beauty in nature. I think all beauty comes from nature. And we have this philosophy in the way in which we design our arrangements and flowers and materials that... There's the old way of like designing where it's this perfectly symmetrical thing. Okay, this perfect mm -hmm. ball of hydrangeas. To me, that's just like we teeter on this idea of creating structural abstract shapes using floral to like this idea of bringing in more of this I guess, sense of nature, this asymmetry, this sort of wild cascading rambling thing. That yeah. the idea would be is like when you look into a hill, if you look at the hill like on a beautiful spring day, You'll see patches of yellow, white, red, orange, or whatever it may be. But it's not like this perfect symmetry of like yellow, white, red. It's like, you know, patches of it. And you kind of want to yeah. capture what that is and be like, I find inspiration in that. It's like, they're sort of like grouped together in a beautiful sort of way that shows the way in which they um, are maybe capturing light or sun or how uh, their growing conditions may be based on where, like, like those kind of like little moments, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, People take that to extremes where they only arrange flowers based off of where the window is positioned. That's the way in which they would like yeah. them, or like sunlight. You know what I mean? Like you can get super yeah. but and even more extreme about it. That's certainly the case with us if that's what the event or the brief calls for. But at the same time, I'm not so precious that that would call. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but nor am I disrespecting it by not taking into consideration the where it ends up at after the event is done. There's so much weight yeah. in the industry. That's really cool. And so one thing, one thing I, you know, you mentioned, and I almost nodded at the time because it just was so normal sounding to me was that you were working these crazy hours in LA of seven to seven a.m. to eleven p.m. And certainly, when I lived in New York, I was doing twelve slash 15 hour days depending and and that was normal and I, I i feel like first of all the the newer generation that started to work isn't even going near that but <laughs> second of all like it's something we all had to learn our way out of but um how is it now i mean you're running your own thing but has your quality of life changed now that you've been out of corporate but also doing what you want and do you have any goals for just kind of how that continues to look 
Yeah, it's a really good question. It's a lot of things. A, I think it's something I was ready for. The biggest difference is, is I'm choosing things for myself and creating a life that I want to create for myself versus when I was like younger, whether it was the 23-year-old me working in advertising to the 27-year-old me that like, you know, jumped into fashion or things like that, is that I'm choosing and creating a path that is not rooted in what success looks like outside of myself i'm mm-hmm. not trying to like you know constantly chase for another six figure sort of like salary or whatever it may be to prove that i'm successful nor am i trying to live a life or be something that sort of feels like someone else's idea of what this idea is you know what i mean to be again mm-hmm. all these different ide- identities that we've already kind of went over the goal now is that it's not necessarily to minimize the hours that I'm working because now that I'm my own business person and I'm managing others and so on and so forth, it's, it's more of like a, how do I continue doing what I'm doing? Not to necessarily minimize the hours I'm working, but how do, how do I continue this more fulfilling sort of like life in a way mm-hmm. that does, yes, have like a monetary number to it because you have to be about that. But that also allows me the opportunity to like, you know, take two weeks a month off every every quarter. We just accepted the possibility to take this trip to Finland that the Finnish Cultural Institute actually sponsored. There's no way that would ever come about, you know. We're creating more opportunities where we're traveling for work and for pleasure, you know. Um, but then how does that look if we are spending a month in Japan in January, which we're trying to make happen and still uh, sustain and ensure that our clients' needs and services or whatever are met, you know? And then how do you align that with everything else? So in a way, it's just trying to create this lifestyle. One of the things that we were doing to kind of illustrate this whole conversation is adding this idea of like measurement to things without like taking away the spontaneity of things um, and kind of live within like your calendar. Like if you imagine your month and you sort of uh, organize your calendar, like it was like all the major food groups in a way where like blue is all work. The yellow is like your time for travel. Red is like this mm-hmm. idea of like romance and date nights, things like that with your partner. Who knows what other colors you can add in there, whether it's, I don't know, sitting down to make sure finances are order, things like that. And it, if your entire calendar for the month is full of just blue and then you don't have any sort of like i don't know kink for health and wellness and you're haggard you're you don't know the last time you had dinner with your family you yeah. god, god forbid there's no sex in your life like all these things you know what i mean like no wonder your marriage mm-hmm. is failing no wonder like things are happening blah, 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 thing. like it's just more like yeah. an intentionality that is rooted in your commitment to have an amazing life for yourself that's yeah truly yours that like the spontaneity is, yo, you're taking a month, two weeks off every quarter. The ugly things that happens is that you put all these weird words like planning into it. And then it just takes like the fun out of it. But in reality, it's on the communication. It's on what you're creating. And it's all in its intentionality. How does that fan look in action? And then for me, like, yes, I am uh, my own I'm a founder and entrepreneur. And right now, like I was telling you, I'd love to get a business partner. But how do I do all that? With or without a business partner, yeah. with or without an investor, not having to feel like I'm doing it by myself. Yeah. You know, how do I build a community around it? How do I, is it more coffee date? I don't know. But in the end yeah. goal for me, like in the next 10 years, I'd love to be able to still have this energy, still have this excitement that I have the way which I'm talking to you, still have this casualness, but you're still being able to like, be professional in front of someone, all these amazing things, and then be able to like maybe live in New York, which we really love, and then maybe be able to like have a beautiful little country home in Japan, but still be able to go to Milan, yeah. Lone, and be in Miami for Basel or whatever it is that we want to do, you know? Yeah, awesome. Well, cool. No, that's it's just great, and it's great to have to hear about what I've been seeing, and just to to hear about what you've been doing. I think people listening will definitely take note especially of the calendar thing i think that's super important to create balance in a visual way and in a tangible way so though that edged on the 
like periphery of advice, possibly. One thing I like to ask every guest is, do you have any advice or mantra that you like to share with people or an idea that you just would like them to take away from you? I think one thing that I really adapted or adopted, um, and it's a little through uh, the years and years of just like, you know, working on myself, the self account course and things like that we're doing. And we take courses with Landmark Education. And I think we've had this conversation about them in the past. And one of the tools and there's things the world around it is this idea of being your word, which is a lot harder than most people think it is. And then at the same time, being your word and having it happen is like the hardest thing. And I think um, being able to sort of make that be the way in which you operate, like um, if I say that I'm committed to this idea of love and honesty, that's in everything that I do. And that's a practice mm-hmm. that I take on. Obviously, life is just full of like breakdowns. If something comes up, comes up, clean it up. Don't leave any crumbs, basically. Like make it happen. It's not easy. You have your days where you're not feeling so hot, but all there is to do is to gain a communication with those people who are waiting for answers and whatever you say. Yeah. Being your word and just taking action on what you're committed to with integrity and things like that. So uh, the last set of questions I have is called the fun five, and it's just five questions I ask every guest. So the first one is what T-shirt do you have in still wear? Like what's the oldest T-shirt you have in still wear? Put it that way. I'm a big purger and I don't, I like, I like change. And so there's not a physical object that I would necessarily keep. I'm a, I love photos. So I would, if anything, if there's anything that that I keep around, I like photos, especially the ones that, or me and my family when prior to our moving to the U.S. Because I think it's like it's such a beautiful thing to see where where we are. And I'm super close to my family and super proud of what we've done. But yeah, I think that's the one thing. Something sentimental-wise is I don't like, and especially you you think I being in fashion, I'd have like all these things around, but I don't. I don't have any of those sort of like attachments to physical things necessarily. My husband goes the opposite though. He has like an entire t-shirt collection Awful ones from college, like, wish those would all go away. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyhow. And uh, if every day was really Groundhog's Day, like it seemed during COVID, especially where everything was the same, um, what song would you have your alarm clock play every morning? For a while, I was actually just uh, streaming, like, the soundtrack to Spirit Away. Like, mm-hmm. anything that allows you to sort of, like, dream or a little sense of, like, playfulness. I think it's something I would love to, yeah, just have that be, be it. Okay. I don't have a thing for music. To be honest with you, for a while, I was actually, I love YouTube videos. And I would actually stream and just keep things like movie soundtracks. Like yeah. movie soundtracks are phenomenal. Like Transformers, like all these weird sort of like movies. Like mm-hmm. they're so heavy, like so much energy. They're jam-packed. And all you get is like constant energy every three to like two to three minutes. Um, yeah. So for a while, I was actually streaming as I'm working movie soundtracks. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Okay. And then coffee or tea or neither? I have tea and I have coffee. Great. <laughs> <laughs> so both. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. And can you think of something that makes you like laugh so hard you cry or just something that um, just cracks you up when you think about it that makes you laugh? Nothing at the moment. To be honest with you, like it maybe goes back to some images or photos that I keep keep around from from whatever. But I'm like everyone else, like I love a like, good meme. Like all I do nowadays is send my husband like cute photos of dogs and balls or whatever. I never yeah. really keep things for too long. For a while my, my thing was everything is temporary. You know? Mm. Like so therefore I was always it was easy for me to just move on to the next thing. And then who inspires you right now? We just went on this trip. Uh, to Finland, and there's uh, this amazing woman that I met who uh, has been in, in charge of everything from Guggenheim to Meta and things like that. And love seeing her energy and, like, you know, where she's taking her experience and talents and how she's putting that towards something meaningful, whether it's art or something like that. But then at the same time, I love Jonathan Anderson from, like, the brand The Way Bay. I love multiple sort of, like, designers and florists that are international and the way in which they approach things. I took this Ikebana course in our now last trip to Japan, and I really loved this Ikebana instruct, uh, master who had this beautiful approach to design and floral. 
sort of the same way we kind of talked about earlier, how he will take something from nature, but then he's not then putting himself entirely into it to like control it, but he allows it to sort of have it, its its presence, its energy, its even the way in which it's moved, uh, you know, the way in which those branches have moved, those those roots have moved. And then he's bringing that beauty indoors versus trying to like almost capture it in a way. There's this beautiful sense to, of uh, honoring it in that regard. And like, you know, um, right now I'm, I really, uh, my mom passed away seven years ago or a little more than seven years ago. That's been seven years ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, she's been a friend of mine lately. And like, uh, uh, maybe it's because I'm like trying to put words to the things that, that are most important to me and being inspired or the fact that her and my father came here with six kids and started over again, you know, went back to school. Yeah. They bought a house in a year, like craziness, stuff like that, you know, like, and all I can think about is like flowers. I mean, not to say, not to make things significant or whatever, but I think that's, uh, yeah, something to sort of honor and also, yeah, be inspired by. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Oh, that's cool. So I guess the last thing then, Truly, like I said, the last one was, but this is the last thing. Where do you want people to find you online? And if they want to work with you or just learn about you or the business or anything, where cool. should they go? Yeah. So uh, Instagram is FDK underscore florals with an S. The website is FDKflorals.com. Send me a note, yeah. an email, a uh, smoke signal. Let me know if you want to talk about flowers or something special. Cool. All right. Well, thanks, Fernando. This has been a lot of fun. It's been good just to talk to you in this way and just to reconnect. Awesome. So thank you. Pleasure. Thanks for listening. You can learn more about the guest and what was talked about in the show notes. Joe Mafia created the music you're listening to. You can find him on Spotify at Joe M-A-F-F-I-A. Rob Metke does all the design for which I am so grateful. You can find him online by searching Rob M-E-T-K-E. Please leave a review if you like the show and get in touch if you have feedback or guest ideas. The pod is on all the social channels at at More Than Work Pod or at Robbie Comedy on TikTok. While being kind to others, don't forget to be kind to yourself.